hey, Click has a new product coming out called Click Core. It's a really exciting development in the Click community because it's kind of taking the Click engine and the power of it directly to developers. Um, so I want to show you today how to get started with that. Now, Access Group is starting a new kind of Click Core jumpstart program with, with the launch of this new product. So if you're interested in learning more about that, go to our Access Group website, and I'm going to put this link in the description for this video. And you can go and sign up to learn more about our Jumpstart, which is going to help you be able to build a Click Core immediately, help you with scalability and training and things like that. But today what I want to do is just introduce you to the concept of Click Core and just show you how you get started uh, very quickly with it. So Click Core is essentially just the Click engine itself as a microservice. So if you think about the ClickSense server, you get a very big platform that's made to do ClickSense client things. So you have a ClickSense client in the web browser for drawing that, those self-service visualizations. You have a proxy service. You have a repository. You have a scheduler. And then you have an engine. And all of these things are tightly coupled together. Now, this is great for a ClickSense BI deployment, but the engine and its associative power can be used in all kinds of unique solutions outside of this platform. And so what ClickCore does is it just takes this engine piece and it pulls it out as an isolated microservice that you can use to really do anything with. So with that, you get extreme flexibility. You can build anything you want on top of the engine. Now, the flip side of that is that to do anything with the engine, you have to build stuff on top of it. So what I'm going to be showing you today is just how do you initially get started using ClickCore. I think in the future, what we're going to see is ClickCore being able to power custom web apps, being able to power products, having it under the hood. I think we'll see third-party integrations directly into other analytics tools uh, in a very white-label type of way. And I think it's also very key to being able to scale up and scale down environments from a cloud hosting perspective with Clicks. There's a lot of really exciting things that ClickCore brings to the table. And I'm just going to give you a brief kind of glimpse into that today. So to understand how to use ClickCore, we need to first look at how it's being distributed. And that's in the format of Docker containers. So a container is essentially a unit of software that has everything it needs to execute that software. So you can think of it like a virtual machine, like, like a typical VM, but without all the extra things that you get with a VM, like the full OS. So in the case of the Click Core container, uh, what you're going to have is an image that can run everything, has everything it needs to run a Kix engine, and that's it. So you get very little overhead with using it. It's very lightweight, which makes it easy to distribute and scale and, and things like that. Because of this container architecture, you can also leverage the engine across environments. So besides using it on Windows, it's going to work on Linux. It's going to work on OS X, which I'm going to show you today. So that's very exciting as well as that it, it gives us a lot of flexibility on where and how we're going to use the Kix engine and that associative capability. So to get started, uh, you're going to need to have Docker installed on your machine. Docker Community Edition is a free download, so you can get that from docker.com. And once that's installed, you're going to want to have it running. So you'll see in my top right corner here, I have Docker. It's running. Um, so now I have access to, uh, to Docker and its platform, and I can start to, to pull images down. So I'm going to open a little terminal here, and I'll just show you that I have Docker running. So I'll say docker-v just to confirm, OK, I'm running the Community Edition version 17.12. So that's all good, and, and we, can, we can keep going. So the idea behind Docker is that different organizations can publish out images that others can use. So in the case of ClickCore, they published an engine image. So you can find this at docker.com slash ClickCore or from the ClickCore website and the documentation. You'll find links there as well. Um, so I can look at this image in this repository and see some things about it, you know, a description. What is it? It's the Kix engine. What are some other things I need to know, like going and accepting the, the user and license agreement for the beta and things like that? What's also very important is what versions are available. So with Docker repositories, you can publish multiple versions of an image. What that means for Click is that they are going to be publishing multiple versions of the engine out there. And they'll have them tagged by tag name. So the tag name is really important because, as you're going to see in a minute, when I'm ready to work with, uh, Click, with a Click Core container, that's how I'm going to tell Docker which version of the image I want to be using. So right now, ClickCore has one engine out there. It's version 12.160.0. So that's the image that I can be, uh, be using to uh, create this container. So I'm going to go to my terminal to, the first thing I need to do is get that image locally so I can work with it. So you know the repository, the Docker repository has the images. You need to pull them down locally, and then you can use them to spin up containers and, and run them. 
So what I will do is I will pull this way. I'll say docker pull, and then I need the name of the repository that I'm going to be pulling for from. So I have click core slash engine. And the last thing I need to do is give it, you know, the tag name, you know, which image tag am I, version am I going to be pulling down? So I'm going to say I'm going to pull 12.160.0. It's the, it's the only one. And by doing that, that's going to pull that engine uh, down, that image down for me. So you can see it says, okay, image is up to date. I already had the image installed, so it just it checked that and said, I have the latest one. It's on my machine locally. Now I can work with it. Great. So I have an image for the engine. Now what I want to do is actually execute that engine. So that's where containers come in. I want to spin up a container that can run that engine for me. Now you can look in the Docker website and find all the documentation on how to, uh, the different commands you can use to do this with Docker. I'm just going to show you today kind of how to do it quickly in one line and kind of walk through what I'm writing as I do that. So to run an image in a container in Docker, uh, the simplest way to do it is to say docker run and then the name of the image that you have locally. So I can say run click core slash engine and 12.160.0. And that would get an engine running for me. However, it's not going to be useful because there's a couple things I need to really take value of the Fix Analytics engine. The first thing I need is to be able to communicate it with, with it through an API. So to do that, I need to open a port to it. So the engine is going to be listening in its container on port 9076. That's 9076. That's just how Click Core comes out of the box. It's listening on that port. But that's the port that the container is listening on. Your machine doesn't have any mapping to that. So if I want to communicate with the engine, the first thing I need to do is I need to tell it that I want to map an external port. I'll use the dash P attribute to say map an external port to it. So I'm going to use just 977. The only reason I'm doing that is just to show you like this is where your external port lives. This is where the, the, the container port lives in this kind of argument. You could easily map it to the exact same number. It doesn't really matter. All that matters is the second number that this is 976. So that's going to allow me to communicate with the engine from my machine through 977 and it'll route that to the container at 9076. So that'll give me that engine API interface. So that's great because I can communicate with the engine API, but that's not the only thing we need to be able to do with the engine. We also need the engine to be able to work with data, with files, like it needs to be able to read in files, it needs to be able to write out QDFs, things like that. So to do that, I need to do what's called mounting a volume. I need to create a directory on my computer where um, I can tell my container to go look and be able to read and write into essentially. So I want to give my container with the engine access to read and write from a folder. So I will do that. I'm going to look in my finder real quick and show you that I've already kind of created this empty data folder in this directory that I'm in, this getting started with click core directory. So I'm just going to mount that volume to it. So again, the arguments are kind of what you're mapping externally to what you're mapping internally. So I'm just going to call the internal one slash data just to keep the same kind of naming convention. And for the external one, I'm going to put an absolute path. So I'm going to use uh, this, this variable for my current working directory and call this data. So that'll say map the data to the data. Map the, this data folder externally to this data volume internally. So the container will be able to access it from there. So that's all good. Uh, one other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add this dash D command. That's just going to run the container silently. If I didn't have that when I run this container, this terminal will be showing me that ongoing process, uh, which I don't want to have in this case. Okay, there's a couple more things I need to do to have this work. Uh, now that I've set up the container properties, I also need to set up some commands to send the container that are specific to, uh, to click core itself. The first of which is to tell it where the document directory is that it should be reading and writing to. So we mounted a volume into our container. We told our container to be aware. And by the way, don't miss this typo that I made. There should not be a space there. Uh, we kind of told our container, hey, have this data folder. But we need to tell ClickCore that that data folder is where the document directory is because you could mount all kinds of folders into this container. So to pass a command, I'll use dash s. And this comes after we've uh, created the written the parameters for the, the container and, and said which image we're going to use. And I'll say dash s document directory and I'll say equals slash data. So that'll tell click core use that document that specific folder inside the container for reading and writing uh, files. And I also need to add a second command to accept the end user license agreement so that click will let me run it. So if you don't do that, click will give you an error when you try to connect to it and say, you know, you can't you haven't accepted the license so you can't use the product. 
So when I press enter here, what's going to happen is I'm going to get back this GUID that's going to tell me this is kind of the GUID of the image running. You actually see on the left there that something changed. So a search folder popped into the data folder. And that was just the engine kind of putting some metadata that it needs to run effectively into the document directory. So if you see that, then you know that it's worth at least that you've got it set up properly. If you don't see that folder appear, you may have missed an argument somewhere up here and you may need to uh, revisit these steps. Now I can look and see what images are running. I can use a command called docker ps. It'll show me all the, the currently running containers. What you can see is I actually have a bunch of engines running because I've been working a lot with core and doing multiple projects. The, the one at the top is the one we just created. So you'll see it's been created 30 seconds ago. It's been up for 31 seconds. It's got that port mapping from 97.7 to 97.6. So now I know that I have this container uh, running properly. So now we have an engine running. That's great. I also want to show you just as a demo, like how do you interact with that engine? So you can use the engine API against that port 97.7 to actually um, run engine API commands and interface with that engine. Uh, so we're going to do that today. I'm going to use RxQ, which is a library I created to do reactive programming in JavaScript with the Engine API. You could use Enigma.js or any other kind of maybe Enigma Go or any engine interface you have will work with this kind of approach. So I have this uh, Visual Studio Code opened at that folder where there's that data in there. And I'm just going to create a script called createapp.js. So I'm going to use Node and my RxQ library to do this. If you want to learn more about RxQ, I have a whole seg segment of videos in my channel that details how do you get started from kind of beginner to advanced. Uh, that I've been kind of it's been an ongoing process creating those, so you can you can learn some of these things from there. So I'm going to skip over the the, the details and go pretty quickly here. But essentially, I'm going to install my RxQ package. I'm also going to install RxJS, which is what we use to do our reactive programming with RxQ, and that gives us the observable type we're going to use. So I should now have RxQ and RxJS installed in these node modules folders. So what I can do here in my app is I can say, okay, my API, what I'm going to create is like a, is a structure that's going to say, I want to be able to say node create app and then an app name and kind of spit that app name or use that app name to actually create the QBF file. So what I'll do first is get the argument. So I'll say var app name equals, you can get the process arguments from the process.argv variable. And I just want the second one, which will be the app name. I also want to load in my dependencies. So I'm going to need to be able to connect to the engine. So I'm going to get the connect session function from rxq slash connect. I'm also, once I have that session created, I'm going to want to be able to create an app. So I'm going to load the create app method from rxq slash global for my kind of global function. And the last thing I'm going to need is that I'm going to be doing reactive programming where I take a, a session that's going to connect asynchronously and then map it to a create app call that'll happen asynchronously. So I'm going to use the um, switch map operator from rxjs to handle that. And again, this is covered in some of my other videos about RxQ, so if you're interested in learning this approach, you should go watch those videos. Okay, so I've loaded all the dependencies I have. I got the app name. So you get the app name. We'll say connect the session. So I'm going to create a session observable using connect session. And that just takes in a configuration for my, um, my uh, engine that I want to connect to. So I have host and port. Now the host when you're running a container like this locally is just local host. And the port is that port we defined when we created the engine. So again, our port was 97.7. So I'll use 97.7 and now I have a session observable here. And with that session observable, I can create an app in the session. So I'll call this uh, the create app observable. And it'll take the session dollar and it's going to use the switch map operator and take the handle for the session that gets connected asynchronously and say, okay, create an app in with that handle and use the app name as the second input, which this will determine what the file name will be for that QBF. And then I can subscribe to that to execute that whole process. And my subscribe is going to have three callbacks. It's going to have the success kind of the, the successful callback. It's going to have an error callback and it's going to have a completion callback. 
So in our case, if we have a successful app creation, I want to log out. App was created successfully. If I have an error, I want to know that, and I want to know what the error was. So I'm going to say app was not created, and I'm going to give back the error. And we'll just, for the sake of this shortness of this video, let's not even worry about completing. We'll save that, and with this in place, I should now be able to, and I'm going to open the data folder here so we can see what happens. I should be able to say node create app and pass it an app name like my app. Then I'll say app was created successfully. I'm going to kill that process. And if I look in here, now I have a myapp.qvf file. And I can run this again for another app name. It'll create another app in there. So I'm creating QVFs programmatically with the engine. And you can also see the error handling happening. Like if I, if I did another app again, here's the error. App was not created. And the engine tells me you already have an app in your directory under that name. So I, I, it can't create it there, et cetera. So there you go. That's kind of getting started with Click Core. Uh, we talked about what Click Core was, and we showed how you launch a container and then how you can use tools like RxQ or Enigma to connect to that container and actually run engine API commands. So again, if you want to learn more about Click Core, uh, feel free to sign up for our Click Core Jumpstart. Uh, again, that's on accessgroup.com. So, well, don't worry about the URL. I'll put it in the in the the description of the video, but you can sign up to learn about how you can use ClickCore, tools we have that we'll be providing sort of the jumpstart package so that from day one of ClickCore you can be building applications on top of it.